kind of went dark really quick, but I think what I'm what I'm attempting to say is that creativity in many ways is our soul made tangible through the work that we do. Hello, lovely listener, and welcome to another episode of Breaking the Blocks. I'm Rachel Pierman, your host, and today we're going to be welcoming in Varushka Zarate, who is an amazing foundation paper piecer. She creates these wonderful portraits, and I think through those portraits, you can really see her joy and her love of not only quilting, but life itself. So what blocks has Varushka had to overcome? And how could you overcome some similar challenges? Let's have a listen. Well, hello, lovely Varushka. <laughs> you join me in the Breaking the Blocks podcast studio. This studio is so small and I'm currently, I think, having a, a hot flush or just been affected by all this lighting. <laughs> how are you doing today? Where do I find you today, Varushka? Whereabouts are you in the world? Well, I am delighted to spend this day with you, Rachel, just a few moments. I am coming to you from Southern California. It's a lovely, beautiful, sunny day, a little windy. Um, California weather, it's hard to beat. <laughs> My friend lives in LA, actually, and he, and he used to obviously live here as English. But, you know, he said that it, when he came back here for a little while, he just couldn't cope with the weather. That's what drove oh. him back. He said, I... <laughs> Just because like, the thing is that you can wake up every day in California and know what you're going to do or I'll plan in three weeks, I'll have a barbecue and you know it's going to be okay. Here, <laughs> even in the summer, you plan for a barbecue and it rains. But you have castles, so it's a fair, if it's a fair <laughs> trade-off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and of course, you visited the UK recently, which we'll talk about in a moment. That yeah. was, you, you, you were very excitable on your social media. So, Varushka, obviously, I introduced you there in that little bit of voiceover. I mean, you are a lady who is... Is prolific in many ways. Uh, you do mm. many things, and and you seem to be fantastic at all the things that you do. But I want oh. to, to I want to take you right back to the beginning, or I okay. certainly want to find out when did all of this crafty stuff begin for you? Was it something you did from a child, or what? You know, when did it all start for you? I love that question because I think uh, for many of us creatives, when we first begin creating, we don't really would define ourselves as artists. I mean, at least coming from um, a Latin American country, with, I'm a first American generation. My, my parents um, uh, came to this country, uh, education. And so for us to believe that, you know, an artist is something that is like a unicorn, like they don't really, you know, like it's not something uh, that's, that's necessarily attainable. And so when I look back on my life, I've created throughout all my life when I was a little girl. Uh, the other day we were looking at family pictures and I would paint uh, t-shirts and I would wear them and I would sing and I would color and all throughout my life I dabbled in some sort of creative expression. And, and it was interesting because um, in many ways, I can sort of compartmentalize or look back on chapters of my life and remember what I was doing creatively during that season. Uh, but in many ways, I felt like I would go from one creative expression, try something else, and then try something else. They wouldn't, the, 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 the medium wouldn't necessarily stick, but the creative process of exploring was always there until I found quilting. And quilting for me felt like it was everything I had ever done all together and just fit my, for lack of a better word, it was my creative soulmate. <laughs> it was the creative expression that has, well, at least at this chapter in my life, really filled me uh, in such an incredible way. I love that. Creative soulmate. I have never heard that expression. I've heard of soulmates, but my creative soulmate. So what does your creative soulmate do for you then, Barushka? I think quilting for me, what it did was it filled not only a creative void that I needed at the time, but it also filled my spirit spirit in a way that other things hadn't before. I, I, I took up sewing almost by accident. I had my two little boys. We thought we couldn't have children for 10 years. 
I, I was working uh, in the counseling psych department here, University of California, um, had gone to grad school, post-grad, left that to raise our boys after we had them. Because the entire time I was at work, Rachel, all I wanted to do was be at home. Yeah. I leave that, stay at home. And for me, my experience of parenting was one where I felt continually like there was this pouring out of myself that was happening, but very little was pouring back in. And as I began to learn about quilting and sewing, I felt this pouring back into myself in a way that was profoundly therapeutic. And so when I say my creative soulmate, it is not only my therapeutic, it it filled me therapeutically, but I felt like quilting really ticked off many of the uh, creative expressions that I'd done before. You know, there's a design element, there's an execution element, there's a peaceful, isolated experience of creating element, there's um, the tactile element, there's a, a drafting element. And so for me, it felt like it was all of the things I had experimented with in one beautiful uh expression uh, where you're doing all of these simultaneous things that are that are triggering all of those beautiful parts in your brain and in your heart all at the same time that's yeah. that's how it felt for me and i think yeah. for me i realized that quilting was my thing when you start to sew and all of a sudden you realize that 6 hours have passed and entering that state of flow uh for me was was sort of the self-awareness of wow the, this is my thing because i'm sure you've experienced this where you where you set out to try a new practice or a new methodology or a new uh creative uh you know skill and you're like Ugh, i'm hating this or you're not really enjoying it or you're like you're ticking off the hours and you're like hey this is supposed to be for fun right <laughs> I'm not at work clicking out uh, minutes. So when you don't experience that flow creatively, you realize, well, maybe this is just isn't a good fit for me. Well, quilting, the opposite was happening. I was experiencing these wonderful moments and stretches of flow where I would start and then six hours would pass. And um, so that's, that's sort of a touch on why I say my creative soulmate, because in many ways it, 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 um, it really fills me uh, creatively, uh, my heart, my brain. So it's, it's been a wonderful thing. Well, here's a question. So do you have to be in a good space for you to get into the flow? Or are you, or, or sometimes does it work the opposite? If you're feeling anxious or you're in a bad place, do you then use it to help you feel better about, yourself mentally and get yourself into a better space how does it work for you that's that's a wonderful question um because i i think it works both ways i mean there uh, just reflecting a little bit there have been moments where uh, i say to my husband take the kids to the park because i want to like i want to jump into my sewing machine or i want to jump on my computer and start drafting ideas and then there are other moments where I realize I feel flooded with life, <laughs> with, you know, the world falling apart, with everything happening. And I feel myself feeling uh, flooded or anxious or sad. And so there's also this discipline of self-care where I'm like, you know what, maybe I should sit at my sewing machine or my computer and start, you know, playing and and slowly fill my 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 cup again and and in that way there's a part of prioritizing your own self care in knowing what will fill you again it's kind of like i mean i don't anymore but back in my college days i used to run and i enjoyed running most of the time <laughs> most of the time i did it because i know i needed to but a lot of it was kind of, it's kind of like getting to the gym, right? You know, you want to get to the gym. You should get to the gym. Like the struggle is just getting there. And then once you get there, you're like, oh my God, why didn't I come sooner? And I think even, even with things that bring us joy in life, there's also this element of discipline where, where just going from the place you are to where you need to be, be sometimes just takes grit and determination to get there. And so uh, I, I would say both 
And, you know, when I'm feeling great, I love to create. When I'm feeling sad or、um, low, sometimes it takes an extra push to say, okay, I'm, I'm feeling flooded or I'm feeling empty. I know I need to get outside and get in the sunshine. I know I need to drink a cup of water. I know I need to get to my sewing machine.、Um, I mean, if we have that self awareness of the things that can fill us back up again, sometimes it's just ugh, pu- pushing ourselves to the point where we can do that for ourselves to, to fill us up again. And, and, and,、uh, and quilting has been that for me in many ways. Is the piece that you finish different? To if you start something in a really amazing mood with lots of vibrant energy, is the end result different? That's a really fantastic question. And I find myself thinking about two things. One is the final project, like what did you actually create? And one is the emotional experience of the project. So let me give you an example. I,、um, I started this in. This wonderful quilt.、Uh, I received permission from this sculptor here in the United States、uh, based off of a beautiful statue in North Dakota called the Dignity Statue. It's a 50 foot stainless steel statue, stainless steel and glass. I mean, it's spectacular of a Lakota woman with a Lone Star quilt,、uh, and the quilt is outstretched. And to me, it seems like that moment, right? You know, when you take a blanket and right before you wrap yourself in it. Well, the statue captures that, like right before she's wrap, about to wrap herself in it. And I reached out to the sculptor and he said, okay. And I started working on this project. I was really excited about it and was designing it, was drafting it, you know, making all of the mistakes along the way that we make and editing. And、uh, my, my father was、uh, dying of cancer and、um, he passed. And You know, lots happening in that season. And I set that project aside. And coming back to what I was talking about at the very beginning, there was this part right after he had passed where I just felt numb. All that anticipatory grief that I'd felt right before his passing just kind of I went into pause emotionally, mentally, just kind of doing the things I needed to do as a parent, as a wife. And One day I said, you know, Virushka, you have to go and sit down and, and just, just, just work, just, just play with fabric, just sit. And I remember just out of discipline being like, okay, I'm going to start working. It's called the Dignity Statue, right? And just the word itself, dignity. And when you see a parent begin to、um, deteriorate the questions of dignity and of meaning, and all of these things begin to pop up. and And so I, I started working on it, right? And I will say that there is a bittersweet experience that I have now when I look at that quilt top, because I haven't even finished it yet. I finished the top and I just laid it. I mean, I need to do the backing, I need to do the, the, the quilting on it. But when I look at it, there's a sweet experience because it was, it's been a fun project. I was able to execute it well. But there's this, this, Bitter aftertaste. Nobody knows about it except me because I worked my grief through that project. And actually, I worked my grief through that project when my dad died. And I worked on my grief as my father was dying on another project. And I mean, this, this kind of went dark really quick, but I think what I'm, what I'm attempting to say is that creativity in many ways is our soul. Made tangible through the work that we do. And whether that's、uh, just getting something out or processing something or just finding meaning in creativity, I think that's why we create. And I am not the type of person, you know, there's some people like, I need, I need tragedy to create. <laughs> like, you know, like the Van Goghs and musicians are like, oh my God, I like every. Song is a breakup song. Like they、yeah. need the tragedy to be. I- I'm not that person. I don't need tragedy. Actually, I think I flourish better when things are going great. <laughs> but,、um, but, uh, but I definitely look at some pieces in my life and recall what I was going through as I was making them. And you know, sometimes, Rachel, I wonder when people ask me about my work, like my Joan of Arc or my Pride and Joy quilt with me and my boys. I'm like, how deep should I go? <laughs> like, 
like how much should I, you know, because there's such a thing as oversharing. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I just stick to the artistic kind of uh, framework of why I created something. But um, I guess that's the long answer that we as creative creatives or artists are the ones who realize what barriers or blocks we hit sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally in life that we either choose to kind of lay under and let the heaviness just kind of paralyze us, or we really have to dig deep and, and cross over. And I think that were it not for creative expressions, that it would be more challenging to do that. Um, in, in a way, I think creativity is, is like the the exercise of the heart and the brain. I mean, we all know that physical exercise does a lot in so many ways to our human experience, our body, our mind, our heart. But I think in many ways, creativity is the, the heart and mind's tangible physical expression of what's happening. And I think there's a lot of working out emotionally that happens when we, when we create. Yeah. I'm kind of lost for words in term, and this doesn't happen very often, Varushka. Ask my husband. In terms of, you know, how just beautifully you've just expressed what you've said. And there are so many things that I was wanting to, I mean, obviously, you know, when you're doing a podcast, you can't talk over each other, but there are so many things that I was like, yes, oh, yes, <laughs> yes. And so many things I want to come back to. I mean, you know, with your dad passing, you and I had a conversation because I lost my dad a year ago. I really feel there is something when you lose someone who is so close to you or a parent, you begin to realize your own mortality. Yes, I think that's obvious. You think about your parent perhaps and what they didn't achieve maybe. And, and you feel like if they had that moment to come back, what they would achieve. And so the, for me, I almost felt driven to to want to achieve more things for my dad. You know that Richard E. Grant, the actor, talked about the passing of his wife and his book is called A Pocket Full of Happiness. And what he says is that she said to him when she was dying of cancer, I want you to find a pocket full of happiness every day in your life, mm. which is so wonderful. And, and I think that's something that really I felt when my dad passed on is that if he could have said something as eloquent as that to me, it would be that. Find something, mm. Rachel, every do day that, that makes you happy and also strive, you know, and in my case, it's this business. Strive for this business. But also, yeah. as you just said, creativity is in your soul. And mm. I really feel like being able to do podcasts with you and, and, and lovely artists and work with artists every day and, and see people enjoying themselves and, and other people finding their passions and coming back to life. For me, that's in my soul. So I absolutely agree with you. Creativity feeds our souls. It's in, an important thing to do. And I do think that when a loved one passes on, it somehow drives you on. I think obviously the initial time, as you said, you just like, oh, I can't do anything. Yeah. But I, I, I think then you get, you get this inner driving force that's, yeah. that's what I found it took me a few months but yeah. I, I find that I'm driving that that wagon every day now you know grief is a complex monster right yeah. and and in many ways you know when I create something there's always this little twinge of ah oh, shucks I wish my dad could see it right or um or even like thinking about you know we spend so much of our time creating and being so worried about what people think. And when your time is up, like no one really cares <laughs> about, you know, my father wrote like 10 books and he was, he was so ambitious in his desire to create, 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 to leave a mark. And the truth is outside, you know, we're so quickly forgotten by the world, except for the people that we love. Uh, but I, and in many ways losing him and all of that experience also helps me focus on who I have. So, you know, losing a parent while you have children is super hard because in many ways you feel so vulnerable. You feel childlike again. You're like, dang it, I'm not going to have him to, even though they don't necessarily do it as much when we grow up, but my daddy is not going to be here like to ask him questions to like save me if I ever need saving. Not that we ever, you know, but that that feeling that safety blanket of a parent is is gone. And yet at the same time, you need to be that for those around 
you, you know, having two little boys who were looking at me. And so there was a lot of refinement. You know, I've never experienced the death of a father before. And, you know, my children would come up to me and they would say, Mommy, are you, what's, are you sad? And I would say, yes, I'm sad, but I'm okay. And I love you and I'm here for you. And you're going to be okay, right? And, and for me, creating, uh, sewing, this entire experience has been an expression of who has been in my life, who has gone, and who is. And in many ways, creatively, I must keep going for my own self and for the little two pairs of eyes that look at me as an example of overcoming. This world is broken, right? There's a lot of brokenness in this world, but there's also a lot of beauty. So look for the beauty. Look for, look for the things that bring you joy. You know, one of the things that I talk about sometimes in, in my work is psychology has these two frameworks. I mean, there's a lot of frameworks, but to sim you know, simplify, classic psychology looks at what's wrong with you, right? Oh, you have depression, anxiety, complex trauma. You know, let's see what's wrong. Let's see how we can remedy it. Let's see how we can um, not fix it, but uh, alleviate it and develop self-awareness and move forward. But there's this other frame of psychology called you know, positive psychology, which says, what's working in your life? And can we do more of that, right? What, what are the things in your life that bring you joy? What are the things in your life that bring you meaning? What are the things in your life that challenge you? And do more of that in moments of difficulty, in moments of barriers, right? Because I think oftentimes we're like, oh, I'm so depressed. And we focus on the set, which we all do. I'm confession me too but i'm so sad and so you want to stay on you want to stay wrapped in the comfort of the sadness where i i have to move forward and and what are the things that bring me joy and how can i do more of that quilting absolutely has become that for me and and i and i'm sometimes i'm curious what that will look like in a few years from now you know but it is most certainly an expression of of the things that bring me joy even though there are barriers and blocks that would want to continually bring you down you know we all have triggers so as mm. you were saying there about finding the joy in life and we have triggers which can make us feel you know very angry and have these explosive emotions and can make us feel depressed and anxious but someone said what we have to start doing is looking for the glimmers because there mm. are glimmers in life and if you focus on those that's what brings you the happiness and joy and i loved that when i read that i thought yeah because we focus so much on triggers but let's try and even focus on a more positive word i was going to ask you as well farushka whether you think that artists this is touching on something you said need to be vulnerable to be a good artist oh my god anytime you create something it's a vulnerable experience to put it out into the world. And, and social media, for me, in many ways, has been a tremendous gift, right? Because really social media, like, really got going maybe five, six years ago, right? I mean, it's really a brand new baby. I think I, I read something somewhere, right, in the interwebs about how... You know, years ago, even 10 years ago, if you wanted your work to be seen by someone, you would have to have an agent who would then go out and pitch it, who would then have a gallery who might deem it, you know, um, <clears throat> valuable enough to present at the gallery. Whereas now social media gives us the opportunity to have our work seen by hundreds of thousands of people. And there is most definitely a vulnerable component, number one, of showing your work, of showing your face, of showing your paradigm of life. And I think that goes back to what you were talking about. I think one of the gifts of vulnerability, of, putting, of creating and putting ourselves out there and being on social media and then making a business is you begin to then find your people. There are some people that don't like me. And there are some people that do, and I am not for everyone, although I don't see why not. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, but you know what I mean? You, the, the incredible thing about creatives is that in many ways, we're all 
uh, you know, vulnerable, insecure c- creators who want to be loved. I mean, we're very emotive, right? I mean, it's rare to find an artist who is like cold as a stone heart, right? Cold stone heart. We are the gushy, you know, creative types, like they call us. But I think by putting ourselves out there, by putting our work out there, we are being vulnerable to people's opinions. But at the same time, we also begin to find our people. And, you know, one of the incredible things about the quilting community has been I've been able to connect with folks from Australia, from Scotland, from Cambridge, from Mexico, from Italy, from Canada, from Russia. I mean, this universe of people that are building as really my community. And unless we are Unless we give ourselves the grace to be vulnerable enough to say, I'm going to put myself out there and I will find my people. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, am, am I the kind of person who has a, who, who, who rides a bus full of people? Or am I the type who has a Ferrari with just a couple of seats, right? One is much more precious, you know, having those, the, that, the, that, that small group of people that you connect with, that you can be even more vulnerable with, more open with versus, you know, like a bus of just acquaintances. But I, I genuinely believe it is impossible to find your people, your community without risking being vulnerable. You, you can't have both. Right. Nope. It's like online dating, which, oh, my God, I cannot imagine what online dating is like. But in many ways, like all of my my quilting community in many ways is like quilting online dating, <laughs> like quilting friends dating <laughs> where, you know, you meet a lot of people online, like even you, Rachel, we've only met online. But, yeah. you know, there's a connection. There's a friendship. You feel like if I was to sit and have coffee or drinks with this person, we could have a meaningful conversation. Right. I mean, chit chat is fine, but there comes a point where you're like, oh, my God, kill me. Right. <laughs> um, you want substance. You want connection. But again, I think it is impossible to find your people, to find uh, your community without being vulnerable, right? Without putting your face out there, without putting your beliefs out there. Uh, and and phew, girl, I lose hundreds of thousands of followers, not hundreds of thousands. <laughs> you know, I, I lose tons of followers, but you also gain people yeah. that feel a connection to who you are. Yeah, you gain um, the right ones. But yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. But I think that's very true. I think you have to be uh, genuine. You have to be you. And then, as you say, if people don't like you, OK, that's fine. We, we meet people we don't like all the time. So leave, you know, you leave and you go and find the people that you like. But don't change yourself to be liked by other people because the mask slips after a few mm. weeks and I used mm. to run a TV presenting course where people you know would learn presenting skills and it was amazing I'd see them sitting down talking to me and then they'd stand in front of a camera and become a completely different person and I yeah. would say listen if you're ever on live TV you're not going to be able to keep that personality up because you're going to be terrified yeah. oh, how exhausting huh Rachel yeah how, how exhausting, exhausting. Yeah. How exhausting. And as you've just said, Farushka, so beautifully, yes, you then find your people and your people mm-hmm. find you. It's like some people yeah. will turn on this podcast. They will love it because we're talking all this stuff. Other people will turn on and go, I want to hear about stitching and colors. Like this, I don't want to hear about this mumbo jumbo. And that's absolutely no Well, you can join us for our workshop to learn yes. all of that. <laughs> exactly, to learn about stitching. <laughs> and, and there's no disrespect from me for people who, who want that podcast. No. Podcasts. There are millions of podcasts out there that will do that. There are millions of podcasts yeah, that do what we're doing. You just yeah. choose. You choose what you well, want. Well, and and what's cool, Rachel, is we didn't start this conversation with any kind of agenda. I mean, it just no. started, it, and we've kind of just happened. gone with whatever happens. The the, the great thing about the the time we live in is that it's really a buffet of you know what do you feel like today. There are some times where I want to just unplug my brain, right? One of my favorite things to do is sew and just put on a, 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 a audio book and I'm not even thinking, I'm just listening and, and creating. And then there are other times where you really want something that will, that will get your brain going or, you know, help your heart to process certain things. And both are legitimate and fine. <laughs> And there's a time and place even in your own life where you feel like, okay, I'm ready to have a, a, a more, you know, a deeper conversation or, I, you know, I just want something light. So both yeah. are 
We can talk well, about stitching all day long, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. I don't stitch, so it would be a pretty <laughs> one-sided conversation. Um, what are your greatest fears, Barusha, going forward in your life? Is oh, there my anything? God. I mean, is there a fear that actually you're going to face? Because there's that great book, you know, Face the Fear and Do It Anyway. So is there something that it, you think, oh, that frightens me, but I'm going to do it? Is there anything like that? Dang it, Rachel, you're asking me to be vulnerable then after I, I just said we should. I know. Oh, my God. So I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of pain. I'm mm. afraid of pain that won't go away. Like I saw because I saw it. I'm afraid of my children suffering pain. Sometimes I've worry about becoming obsolete, right? Fear of losing my other parent, right? of reliving whatever I just let relived, relived, is that even a word? But I find a couple of things when it comes to fear. And these are things I tell myself, and I'm choking back a big old knot in my throat. I find that fear is sometimes greater than the very thing we're afraid of. I mean, even when I was really afraid of losing my father. I mean, I mean, years of anticipatory grief. And then the last six or eight months was like, I'm not going to survive this. Our God given capacity of resilience and overcoming is nothing short of miraculous. And so fear is a real struggle for me, for us as human beings because it's an imagined situation that we feel we can't overcome. And I get trapped in that all the time. And I must intentionally, Rachel, set fear aside. Mm. I, I will sometimes say, I'm not, not today. Uh, because it's like this monster, this tiger, that if I feed it, will grow and grow and grow and grow and become. And so my husband once said to me years ago, I think we were even dating at the time. He goes, Varushka, don't worry about something until you have to. Yes. And most of the time you will realize you're never going to have to. And if the worst case scenario happens, which I've had a couple happen in my life, you will find you have the inner strength and resilience to overcome. And so fear is like the, the Loch Ness monster, right? Or like, I don't know, maybe there is a Loch Ness monster, but, <laughs> but like there's so much. It's kind of, I don't know if you watch these shows where the music is so intense, where the, 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 the cinematography is so intense, and then they actually reveal the scary thing and you're like, oh, that's not as scary, right? It's yeah. almost like the movies that are all intense but never show you the monster are scarier because fear feeds on itself and becomes bigger and scarier and, and, and ov overwhelming when, in fact, the actual situation isn't as scary as you thought it would be. So fear for me is a very self-defeating, treacherous thing. And it's something that I continually fight about. You know, what if, what if it does? It's so funny. So when I was going to Cambridge, I was really nervous, R Rachel. You know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm, the, I'm a little California girl. Would the Brits like me? <laughs> There's 60 of me. them, which was like yeah. giant, uh, like uh, an insane <laughs> amount of quilters in one room. They're all usually older than I am. So it's like, does she know what she's... So my husband's like, Farushka, are you okay? And I'm like, oh my God, I I'm nervous. He goes, nervous about what? And I said, I don't know. What if I forget to sew? Like how to sew? <laughs> and he's like, are you... Are you kidding me? And so I did it. And it was it was an awesome success. It was just an incredible experience. And I came back and goes, so did you remember how to sew? <laughs> but, Brilliant. you know, fear is just a ridiculous, self-defeating inner child that's just afraid of the boogie monster. And most of the time, the boogie monster doesn't come out. And if there's even a minimal boogie monster, you find that you have the capacity to overcome, to move forward, to create n n new avenues for things. And you build and you grow from those experiences. So 
that's my answer yeah, <laughs> oh I, my god yeah no I, I i i'm just nodding and nodding and nodding i mean the wizard of oz comes to mind in terms of one of those films you were talking about because everybody the what? was terrified the wizard of oz the wizard you of know? oz yes oh what terrified. a great analogy the Wizard of Oz, the voice, the scariness. Oh, yeah. And guess what? It was a little man behind a curtain. So yeah. it's that, that's exactly what fear is. And I think yeah. fear does hold us back. And oh, I yeah. think, as you said, you have to face those. That's a great book. Face the fear and do it anyway. You have to do it because fear will paralyze you. And Absolutely. as you said there as well, you know, I do believe that through pain, that's when we grow. I think that if life is just trucking along and you don't step outside your comfort zone and if you've got fears, you don't face them, you will not grow as a person. You have to go through painful situations yeah. to, to grow. I mean, I've grown so much in the last few years. You have to go through to find yourself. It, it comes down to, I'm afraid of making mistakes because then I'll be embarrassed and what are people going to think of me? right? Well, the reality is people don't think of us, Rachel. No, <laughs> they only think of themselves, don't. right? I am sure in your entire journey of being, because you are a creative, I mean, the very fact that we've been having this conversation, that you have a heart for creatives, you have a yeah. heart for bringing people together to create, you are a creative. You know, we're, 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 we're constantly afraid of making mistakes. But Oh my God, Rachel, the amount of mistakes I've had to make as I'm learning is epic. There's a saying in our home, we go, we learn from our mistakes, right? Because my kids are practicing handwriting. I'm like, I can't do it. So we're like, I can't do it yet. Oh, I made a mistake. We learn from our mistakes, right? <laughs> but it's hard to make mistakes, especially publicly and when you're trying to build a business and when you don't know all of the things, legal, nitty gritty, financial, I mean, we must make mistakes because then, oh my God, okay, I learned from that. How can I adjust? And, and you have to give yourself some element of grace, right? Where you're like, I'm making mistakes. All right. I'm going to connect with that customer, that quilter. Hey, I'm so sorry. You know, I've learned from our interaction. Next time I'm going to do A, B, and C. Um, but the less we are afraid of making mistakes, the less we are afraid of being embarrassed, then the more we exponentially grow. And then we're like, oh, my God, look what I did today. Look what I was able to achieve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and like you say, the, the growth comes from that and then life gets better. And then you learn as well that when you have faced those fears, you can face future fears. And then maybe because you've done that, the anxiety lessens. And that right. means then that you're not as anxious, you're not as worried. So then you start being able to do more things. I think it's, you know, some people say it's, it's what you're putting out into the universe, you get back. And yeah. some people go, well, that's absolute nonsense. But I think there's something in it. But I think it's I just do. that if you're feeling good about yourself and you're putting out good and you're doing good i think you get it back because i think energy attracts energy that's scientific energy attracts yes. energy and i think like energy does so yeah absolutely i think uh, you have to go through those painful moments and you have to face those fears you know have those conversations have those difficult conversations i had something today with someone you know a very good friend of mine who felt that he needed to say something to me um, because it was going to sit inside of him and he mm. started it by saying i am not attacking you you, but I want you to know how I feel about something. And I wrote back and said, well, actually, I tried to call him. But then I said, look, this is how I feel. I completely respect what you're saying. Da, 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 da. And then he ran me tonight. We're almost in tears. It's like, I love you. I love you, too. And because, you know, we've we've opened it. And what could have happened is he could have festered on that. Mm. And I could have festered and we could never have spoken and it could have ripped the relationship apart. You have yeah. to be vulnerable. You have to be open. You have to just go with what's in your heart. And, and if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out and you move on. You move yeah, on. And it's also life. a question of how, how, how authentic and meaningful of a life do you want to live? Yes. You cannot have authentic, real relationships without being honest about the good and the bad, right? Yes. Relationships are not all just pink, unicorns and rainbows. I mean, there are some nitty gritty components. And if you want an authentic relationship, you have to be real with that person. And <clears throat> something you were talking about before, I know, I know our time is almost up, but I, I'm yeah. so excited to talk to you is this whole component about making mistakes. I, I've encountered this behavior where people pretend to know what they don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know how to do that. Or yeah, I know this about quilting. Or Oh, yeah, I know how to do this. And 
I think that is such a disservice because we're pretending to know something we don't know because we're afraid of embarrassment or being less than. But what a missed opportunity to say, hey, no, tell me more, right? Hey, do you know how to do this whip stitch or do you know how to do this curved piecing? Or I, you know, I don't. Can you tell me more about that? And I think that if, if we're open to being authentic, right, to being real, to learning and giving ourselves grace, then we will actually find that in the moments where we feel we fail or don't, not fail, but we, we don't know as much or we don't have the experience, that we then don't take on the opportunity to actually learn something from the encounter, right? Just say, you know what? Tell me more about that. Or, hey, thank you, friend, for telling me that. Because even though this was my experience, what I hear you saying is that you felt I wasn't attuned to what your experience was. So, you know, you're and now I know based on what you're telling me, right? Yes. So I, for me, that's been a big part of, especially when you get to certain unexpected levels in your craft or in your niche or whatever, people assume you know everything, which is really cute because nobody does. And I've been, I've been trying to be really intentional about I, I don't know everything. Tell me more about how you do this. Or even in my same craft, right? Foundation paper piecing, large scale portrait work. If someone does it different, hey, how do, how do you do it? Um, because in connecting with other people, the whole point isn't to one up each other, right? But it's how do we, in our connection, build each other where a part of me is given to you and a part of you is then given to me. And I come out of that interaction a better and different person. I mean, at least that's the hope you would want out of <laughs> connections with people, which for me, I think the quilting community is that. It is a tremendously genuine community of people that come together and learn from each other, give to each other, edify. And it has been, aside from the craft, which we talk a lot about, truly the best part of the craft is the community. The best part of the quilting is the friendships and the connections and the, 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 the people that I meet. Because to create isolated only goes so much. You need community and friends and that's where the real magic happens. And I feel so blessed, Rachel, every day that I have found my people, continue to find my people, grow my people, and I really feel like there's a worldly sisterhood and brotherhood of crafters who, yeah, we enjoy quilting, but the type of people that they are are my type of people. It's like you're cut from the same cloth, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. Is there any one final motto that you have in life? Because mine, one of them, is that in order to experience new lands, we have to lose sight of the shore. So I homeschool my boys. We have this motto that we do at the beginning of every um, class period of every day, which is I have a growth mindset. M, I learn from my mistakes. I, I can improve by working hard. N, I will never give up. D, I am determined to do my best. S, self-reflection will help you succeed. E, I can overcome challenges with effort. And T, I will train my brain. And even though that's something that I give them, I find there are moments that I'm like, okay, I'm new. I don't know how to do this. I'm training my brain. It's not, I can't do this or I'm not smart. No, I'm training my brain as long as, as soon as my brain gets trained, right? I can do this. Like, I mean, it's not one motto, but it's definitely the thing that I, I even have to develop a positive mindset of, I am as good as my perspective. You know, I can achieve as much as I set my mind to do. And, and that, it's helped my boys a lot, but in, in reality, it's really ingrained for me. Do a, just keep going. I can achieve this. It, the messages I tell myself internally, you know, there have been many moments where I've been wanting to give up in my quilting world as a public thing. You know, I've had epic failures, um, you know, and, and mistakes happen and, and it's easy to want to just give up, but, 
pulling through also tests you and and your capacity to overcome. And it builds emotional muscle memory, right? To say, yeah, today was a crappy day, but I'm going to keep going. And maybe there's a sparkle that'll happen in the end if I just do. Um, so that would be my my long motto, <laughs> I guess. Well, I love it. I'm, I'm going to write it on my wall. I'm going to write it a brilliant motto. And I have to say, you know, you certainly have brought me great joy at the end of my day. And you have put a oh. sparkle in my day. I now feel oh. so much less stressed than I did before I started talking to you because I've had an awful day. So it just shows you perseverance, keep going. And uh, yes. I love it because your Instagram handle, of course, is pride and joy quilting. Mm -hmm. So I love that um, yes. because it, it has been a joy and you spread the joy. And I encourage mm -hmm. anyone to go and have a look at your um, Instagram handle your, because I just love the way that you present yourself and talk to the world. And you have these amazing smiley pictures you just bright up people's day. So I say continue doing whatever you're doing. That sounds very patronizing. Oh, okay. But continue doing no, what you're not doing. At all. I love it. And so many other people do. Thank you so much Thank Borussia, you, Rachel. for appearing Thank on my very little brand new podcast that I hope, okay. like our mindsets, will grow. <laughs> yes. It's been a real privilege to sit and talk with you. And I think the fact that we've been able to have such a authentic conversation speaks a lot about the the type of person you are so it is my privilege to be on here and i wish you all the success as you oh. continue to grow your podcast thank you i feel like i should say namaste namaste <laughs> <laughs> break those barriers rachel yeah. <laughs> have a good day 